Today is June 9, 2017, and we are going to continue our studies of the community rule. Let's ask our Heavenly Family to bless us with understanding. Elohenu, our mighty ones, thank you for loving us and giving us this message, correcting us on our so many errors and for showing us a better way. Please guide us in this discussion tonight to understand how to acquire knowledge, how to conduct a proper experiment Give us an experience of your love and help us to apply the principles which we learn to our own experience. Help us to be reasonable people and logical thinkers. Help us to be the people who we need to be to change the world. Toda. Thank you. We ask this, Bashem Tzemach, in the name of Branch. Amen. Amen. So, in tonight's community rule study, we will follow our same usual pattern, that being first, a summary of what the community rule is, an explanation of why it is important, and also what exactly are our methods of investigating the community rule. Then we can have comments and questions broadly related to the subject, and then continue on our line-by-line -line investigation of the text. So first, I'll ask you guys, as I've done one other time in the past, some questions about the community rule. Maybe you guys can uh, answer them. So. First question is, what is the community rule? Anyone can answer. Well, I believe it was um, the first uh, scroll found of the Dead Sea Scrolls, for one thing, very ancient document that the, I believe it was the uh, people known as the Essenes um, used to pattern their, I don't know if that's the right way to put it, pattern their lives after, but, but it was several hundred written according to what we think uh, that it was written maybe at least two or three hundred years before the time of Christ. And it's mentioned in some places by Christ. Uh, maybe John the Baptist might have mentioned it as well. <clears throat> Let me think so I can think of anything else <laughs> to say about it. Uh, the writer is known as the teacher of righteousness, although we don't know who that was yet. And it was uh, basically a bunch of principles that a community of people were able to um, use to all get along in harmony with each other. And that's really all I can think of to say right now. Okay, sure. Yeah, I know that was definitely a lot of good stuff. Uh, there's a few points I'll clarify, though. Uh, so, yeah, two or three hundred years, it's actually 200 years, so... Yeah, that, that general time, before the time of Jesus. So this was written at some point in the uh, early part of the second century B.C. And um, a another thing, too, is in our studies so far, we have not been able to determine who the author of the community rule is, or even if it has only one or multiple authors. So I don't know for sure whether the teacher of righteousness 
wrote any part of the community rule. And I don't know if anyone else here actually knows that one way or the other. We do know, though, that the Teacher of Righteousness wrote the Thanksgiving hymns, and uh, what's the other one? Well, Barki Nafshi yeah. is, is one thing, and there are several others. And we talk about the Teacher of Righteousness a lot in our community rule studies because the Teacher of Righteousness was the one basically who started the Qumran community and that sort of thing. And, okay. Yeah. You know, so, so there's a connection there, but... Um, I used to think that the Teacher of Righteousness wrote the community rule as well. It was seeming like that to me uh, some time back, and I got that clarified as well that we actually don't know. Maybe the Teacher of Righteousness wrote it. There's some language that seems you know, similar to the writing style, but there's no claim to authorship that we know of yet in the community rule, so right. we just don't know for sure. Well, I knew we didn't know yeah. the name, but I did. I, I guess I'll have to try to re remember that. That, um, yeah, I thought I thought he, his title was the teacher of righteousness, whoever it was. But yes, I knew we didn't know who it was. So I got to remember that part too now. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, so that's the thing, and we know whether he wrote it or not we know that it does contain some of his teachings. So the section on the two ways or the two spirits is a teaching that originated with the teacher of righteousness. And we know that because, well, for several reasons, but one of them is that it's contained in the Thanksgiving hymns. So he actually taught it in the Thanksgiving hymns. Um, and comparison with all other ancient literature shows that there was nothing like this before the Teacher of Righteousness. And then also um, the Damascus document in looking back on the Teacher of Righteousness says that he is the one who showed us or who revealed to us the way of God's heart. And that's the phrase, the way of God's heart, that is used throughout the Thanksgiving hymns to describe the way of light, God's way, as opposed to the way of darkness, the devil's way. So that teaching, for sure, is a teaching of the teacher of righteousness that is beautifully explained in the community rule. And it may be that the teacher of righteousness wrote at least that section and maybe more, but we don't know that for sure. So that's, yeah, we'll have to study that more. Does anyone else have anything to add in terms of what the community rule is uh, or anything along those lines? I'm not sure if Lynn said that, but um, so the community rule uh, tells us the beliefs, practices, and the organizational structure um, and mission, like a church manual, of the community of Quran. And it's very important for us to understand it now because um, it describes to us or it could give us some ideas of how um, the community of the Jews and the early follow followers of Christ lived. And there is a lot of similarity in the community rule with the Gospel of John the Didache and Odes of Solomon. And basically anyone interested in Jesus, um, the community rule is something to investigate. Absolutely. Indeed, yeah. Um, does anyone else want to add anything? Okay, perhaps there isn't anything from anyone. Um, but that, I think that fairly well summarizes what the community rule is and gives some of the reasons as to why it is important. And um, so now I just want to ask, does anyone or will anyone explain a little bit as to our methods 
of study in regard to the community rule. Well, we're studying it line upon line, uh, almost word for word, and um, comparing it with what we know to be truth, um, performing experiments on it to see if it holds up with um, similar you know, previous truths and looking, looking for truth. That's what we're looking for, not not just because someone said it's supposed to be one way or another. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that um, correctly understood what you said is certainly the case. There's one aspect of what you said that could be taken in a different way. Not that There's I think a lot you... of noise coming through someone, I have to say. Yeah, there is a lot of noise. So I'll just mention by way of reminder for everyone, and in case anyone new is on the call, um, that we make a serious effort to try and ensure the quality of the recordings of these meetings and so on. And so we ask for everyone, while not speaking, to have themselves on mute. And you can do so either by hitting a mute button on your phone, if you have one, or by hitting star six. And that will put you on mute. And then when you want to say something, you simply do the same thing. Again, either hit mute or hit star six, and you should come off mute and be able to make your comment or ask a question or whatever it may be. And the reason uh, why we really ask people to do this, even if they don't consider it to be noisy in their background, sometimes even just having a lot, another line open can create a background noise or a white noise and it just reduces the quality of the recording. So yeah, thank you everyone for that. So anyway, Mom, the aspect, I, I do believe that you understand this aspect, but I want to mention um, how someone might take part of what you said, and then I'll give you the opportunity to, to clarify that point. Um, so you said, uh, you know, comparing it to what we already know to be true and things that we've previously found and, and so on and so forth. Well, someone might say to that, well, that sounds an awful lot alike um, just coming with your preconceived ideas. So how, how do you explain that? You know, how do you reconcile what seems to be a conflict there with coming to the community rule with what we already know to be true, apparently, and ridding ourselves of preconceived ideas. Well, I guess those would have those other um, things that you know I mentioned that we already know to be truth would also have to be truths that had been um, held under the magnifying glass and proved. Um, I'm trying to think of some other ways of putting that. I'm not really good about um, doing a review, not like you or anybody else, really. Um, Mary's really good at that. Um, but yeah, not preconceived ideas, definitely, because we've had to unlearn a lot of things that we thought were truth, just mainly because it was tradition or someone older than us told us that in Sabbath school class or Sunday school class, whatever. And um, yeah, so, so it would have to be truth that we feel like can be proven. And if it can't be proven, then we, and if we can't prove it false, then we have to say we don't know because we have to be fair. Okay, that's sure. all for now. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's good. And I think you're doing the all right job of explaining things for sure. Um, I'll offer a little bit more explanation to it anyway, though. Um, so basically, the way that I would express how to approach it in regard to the aspect of coming to something with knowledge that we already have and 
you know, contrasting that with the idea of having preconceived ideas is this. So no matter what, we all do have preconceived ideas. It is actually impossible to come to something with a totally blank slate. We can't literally just empty our minds of all knowledge. We all have some sort of idea of what something is like, and that's actually a necessary prerequisite to understand something, whether rightly or wrongly. We have to have some sort of prior knowledge of something, and that's why an infant right out of the womb couldn't pick up the community rule, read it, and understand it, because there isn't prior knowledge there in order to understand it. So, you know, we have our understanding of language and of, um, you know, what certain words mean and, and all of that, and those are all preconceptions with which we come to any given text. And that's okay, so long as we understand that our preconceptions do not determine the meaning of the thing which we investigate. And so in that sense, we have to put aside our preconceptions, meaning we have to say, no, this does not necessarily inform what this text says, and we have to be open to it having a different view from us. We have to be open to uh, new information which we did not previously have coming to light and correcting us on things, and maybe some of our preconceptions are wrong, and we have to toss out certain ideas in favor of other ones, or perhaps even we have investigated something very thoroughly and have come to a wrong conclusion based on a lack of information or a lack of right principle or whatever it may be, and then something else, let's say something in the community rule, shows us, oh man, we were wrong on that, and so we need to now go with whatever the truth is. Yet, at the same time, we have to say, when we have conducted experiments on something time and time and time again, and shown, yes, this is in fact true, obviously we don't forget it. So, you know, we can... It's not all just uh, two categories, black and white. Um, it, there's kind of a gradation of, of confidence that we may have in our various preconceptions. So, for example, if we come to something and it challenges a preconception that we have, and let's say it challenges two preconceptions, and I'll give one that we currently have and one that we used to have. So let's say the first preconception is the idea that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. That's a preconception that we used to have but no longer have. And then another preconception, one that we currently do have, is the idea that the nature of reality is in fact material. So let's say we read a text and it challenges both of those preconceptions and let's say we still had the idea in mind that R Moses wrote the Pentateuch. Well, if we notice, hey wait, this challenges an idea that I currently have and that idea is that Moses wrote the Pentateuch but I don't actually have evidence for that idea. Well then, there isn't as much required on the part of the other text in order to overthrow our preconception. In other words, all it might have to do is point out the fact that there's no evidence for the Mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch, and that might uh, just cause us to realize, hey, wait a second, if I make that claim, I must have evidence for it, and then we can go and examine the evidence and find, oh, there is no evidence for that idea, and therefore my preconception is now overthrown. Now, when it comes to the other issue, let's say there's a text and it's challenging our conception of the nature of reality as being material. Well, that conclusion is not one that we came to 
by tradition or simply having something um, that we read somewhere and didn't really investigate it but ended up believing it, that conclusion is one that we have arrived at due to many experiments. And if that conclusion was to be overthrown, it would require a lot more on the part of the challenger, whether it's a written text or an individual, that individual would have a lot to do in order to explain coherently how all of our experiments demonstrating materialism are actually not valid and provide, you know, they would have to provide whatever evidence to the contrary. So that's a lot less likely to happen. And so our, our uh, level of confidence in the idea of materialism is very, very high, whereas our level of confidence in something which we have not actually investigated is very low. And, you know, there's a gradation of things between. And so that's, you know, coming to a text and ridding ourselves of preconceptions and yet being informed by what we have already studied basically consists of recognizing what we have determined to be true by experiment and distinguishing that from what we have only accepted by tradition or you know, some other means that's non-experimental. And we rid ourselves of those non-experimental preconceptions. Our experimental preconceptions, we are open to considering that we're wrong on them if we're reading something that challenges them. And we'll always go with the evidence no matter what it says. Now, of course, if we're reading something that does not challenge our experimental preconceptions, let's say we're reading the community rule, and in fact it does not challenge materialism, and we have a knowledge of materialism, we have established that to be a truth, and there's nothing that we have come across anywhere to the contrary. And in fact, it's the sort of thing that I think we can know as certainly as we could possibly ever know anything, because it is, in fact, by definition true. And so th there are things like that that really, um, you know, yes, they can be tested, but every test, like even trying to discredit them, ends up proving them, that sort of thing. So the laws of logic, so to speak, are like that. And the idea of materialism is like that. So, you know, that's a way to approach our preconceptions and the investigation of something like this that really allows us to not allow our preconceptions to get in the way and yet at the same time use established preconceptions, you know, experimentally established preconceptions in order to judge things. So I can take materialism and say, okay, I've established this definitely to be true. I'm open if someone was ever to come and actually disprove it. Sure. But in spite of that, I can have that as an established fact. And let's say we read the community rule, and it just makes the claim that there's non-physical stuff that exists and doesn't provide evidence and doesn't have enough evidence to overthrow materialism, then we can safely say that those claims are false. So I hope that that helps to, to increase all of our understanding in terms of approaching something uh, rightly in terms of handling our own preconceptions. So are there any other comments in regard to our methods of studying the community rule? How about um, what is the most important point the author is uh, trying to bring forth is one of the methods. Definitely, yeah, that's a very important one because 
we don't want to just make a writing answer our questions. We want a writing to answer the questions which it is trying to address. Because if we just come with our questions and expect it to answer our questions without caring the, the questions the author cared about, we will end up misinterpreting the text. So, for instance, the common thing in Christianity and Judaism when reading Genesis chapter 1 and 2, for example, is to ask the question, what is the origin of the material universe? And because people approach Genesis 1 asking that question and expecting it to provide an answer, they take what it says as an answer to that question. And therefore, they assume that everything that is listed in Genesis 1 as being barad, to mix Hebrew and English, to be quote-unquote created or separated, however the term is to be correctly translated, it's assumed that that is describing the material origin of that thing, that it did not previously exist, it was non-existent or immaterial, and then went from non-existence into material existence. So you have creation ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. And that simply is not the idea explained in Genesis 1 and 2. That is simply what people find in it because they are asking the questions which the author of, well, I should say the authors most likely of those texts uh, were originally trying to say. So that's just an example in order to highlight your point more. But yes, that's an excellent principle that we have to have in mind when reading the community rule and any other ancient or modern writing. Anything else from anyone? So we've been using a method. Um, we would, or first, reading it in context with what's um, previously, you know, the, the few lines before and the few lines after. So we're reading it in context. And then the second thing we do is what Annalisa just said. We're um, trying to determine exactly what the author is trying to say. And then the third thing is what Lynn said, <laughs> where we're trying to uh, um, see how it fits in with, with uh, the truths that we're holding on to now and making sure that it, it's in alignment with truth so that we can say, yes, we believe this. Basically, we're, do we agree we believe it or are we saying this is not supported with our with our beliefs? So it's kind of like a three-step process, and then we all agree together and then move on to the next line. That's basically it. Um, and I'll mention one aspect, and this is totally strictly terminology, so it is uh, to a degree semantics, but I'm going to mention it anyway just for sake of clarity for anyone listening when we're comparing it with our beliefs, it's not that we take our belief to be the measuring stick by which to judge all else. It's to compare things with material reality to see if it lines up with material reality, whether it lines up with our beliefs or not. And if it does, we will adjust our beliefs to be in harmony with material reality if the community rule, for instance, shows us something that we didn't know about it or even if that we had a wrong perspective about. Um, but I understand the reason why you said that because our belief is basically material reality, whatever it is. So our belief in terms of the principle is actually you know, talking about truth as it is in material reality rather than you know, a particular position on whatever doctrine or theology, and we're using that to judge it. So, just a point of clarity. So yeah, I think that summarizes very well what the community rule is, why it is important, and our methods of studying the community rule. And I'll just add one uh, other element 
by way of introduction, I guess, and that is that there are two questions that we have that we are interested to find an answer to if a certain text, in this instance the community rule, does indeed answer that question. So in other words, these are things that we're on the lookout to see, is this text interested in providing us with this information? If not, then we have to say, okay, even though we want to know the answer to this question, unfortunately this text does not provide it, and that's okay. But two questions which, in reading any of these texts, we really do uh, keep in mind is first, does this text claim to be a product of divine inspiration? And the reason why we want to understand whether it makes such a claim is because that radically alters what we are really investigating and how, uh, well, I'll just say it, it changes what the test is. And it also informs us of the purpose of the text. So if it's claiming, for instance, if a text is not claiming divine inspiration, but is instead claiming only to give history on some particular series of events, well then, we're going to investigate it asking questions about historicity. And we can ask those questions otherwise, even if the text isn't trying to do that, because, well, we want to know the past, and if it's mentioning some historical things incidentally, we still do want to know the historical reality. But we want to know what the text claims for itself, what kind of writing it is claiming to be, whether history, whether it's claiming to be a divine counsel, or anything like that because that helps us to know which questions to ask. And uh, I guess the best way for me to explain this next part is just to explain it more fully. That is, if a text claims to be a product of divine inspiration, it claims that the ideas set forth are actually from God, then we need to test it in such a way that will put all of the unique ideas set forth in the text against material reality to see whether they line up. And if even one of them does not line up, and yet it claims to come from a God who speaks pure truth, then that would reveal the inconsistency in the text and thus would disqualify it as actually being a product of divine inspiration from a God who speaks pure truth. So the claim, you know, in concerning Yahweh is that Yahweh is a God of truth and righteousness and so on. So if a text claims to be a product of divine inspiration from Yahweh, and yet puts forward ideas and teachings which are unique and original to that text, and even one of them is not true, well, then it's disqualifying itself from its claim. Sure, maybe it still has some good historical information, or maybe it has some information on something else, like agriculture or whatever, but it could no longer be viewed as a message from Yahweh. So we really want to know that claim whether it is present there or not because it really changes what we are looking for in a text. And the second aspect which we are interested in keeping our eyes out for or our eyes open for is what the moral claims of any particular document are. And, you know, first we want to know is this document interested or was the author of this document interested in making moral claims or speaking about morality and the remedy for immorality 
And if so, what are its claims in that regard? And that is, of course, very important for us because our primary interest is true morality and the practical application thereof. Because, of course, we recognize that this is the number one issue in the world. And there's a lot of uh, working contrary to good and working in favor of and toward evil. And we want to bring an end to wickedness, to selfishness, to unlovingness. So these are moral issues and a text which promotes false morals will not be of help in this sort of issue. And um, a text which promotes good morals and a coherent, rational, truth-based moral system could be of immense value. So those are two primary questions that we always have in mind and that we ask concerning a text. And yeah, we, we hope to find texts that actually address those things, claims concerning their own divine inspiration, if applicable, and also moral claims. You know, we, we always want to find out if a text comments on that. Again, if it doesn't, then we are not going to try to force it to answer those questions, but we hope to find texts that do address those issues. So, all that said, does anyone have any comments or questions broadly related to the community rule? The reason why I say broadly related is because we do want to keep on topic. We don't want to just get into whatever else there may be that someone might have in mind. There's a time and a place for that, but in this study we want to focus on the community rule. But I say broadly related because it could be in relationship to the surrounding history of the community rule or other documents which are connected with the community rule or people who are in some way connected with the community rule or even our methods of investigation. So that said, any comments or questions broadly related to the community rule? All right. There does not seem to be. And just in case there's anyone on who hasn't been on in the past, I try to wait long enough for people to answer questions when I ask them, but usually I try not to wait really more than 10 seconds just because then we have a long silence and we need to definitely keep progressing through the study. So we will continue on our line-by-line -line investigation then. So the community rule found, of course, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, there were several copies found. The best preserved copy is known as 1QS, and that copy has 11 columns of text. In our line-by-line -line investigation, we are currently in the fourth column, and we are right at the end. So this is line 26 to 27. And I'll read from about line 24 just to give us context. And then it's really just the last sentence here that we have yet to discuss. Until now, the spirits of truth and falsehood contend in the minds of men. They walk in wisdom or in folly. According to his portion of truth and righteousness, so does a man hate falsehood. And according to his inheritance in the lot of falsehood, 
so is he wicked, and so hates truth. For God has established the two spirits in equal measure until the determined end and until the renewal. And he knows the results of their deeds for all time. Now this next sentence is the one that we have not yet investigated or discussed in any detail, and it's the one that we will be discussing now. So this is what it says. He has allotted them to the children of men that they may know good and evil, and that the lot of all the living may be according to their spirit in the day of their appointed visitation. I'll read that line again, just because there's kind of, there are several aspects to it. So I'll read this whole last sentence again so everyone can kind of contemplate it more. And then I'm going to ask if anyone has any comments or questions regarding it. He has allotted them, them being the two spirits, he has allotted them to the children of men that they may know good and evil and that the lot of all the living may be according to their spirit in the day of their appointed visitation. Okay. So any comments or questions? I think it's amazing how, um, well, I'm, I've been studying the seven seals, Mary and I have been, and uh, one of the things that's, that's brought out there is the, you know, the four, cre- well, the seals themselves, I mean, they're sealed, there's writing before and after the, the book that contains the seven seals, and Hadif talks about that being uh, basically prophecy um, before the time of, of the people living in whichever era for the seal, and then, you know, the light that's still to come. But every, you know, for each period of time, the people were given enough prophetic light to actually, um, you know, to actually be overcomers. And that's kind of what this is talking about in a way. You know, it kind of aligns up with that. Um, just in, in reading it, you know, it's uh, talking about the t- you know, their time, the destiny of living according to the spirit within them at the time of the visitation. Interesting, yeah. Uh, I hadn't made that connection uh, with that principle that Hadaf discusses in regard to the seven seals, but I totally see what you're talking about. Any other comments or questions? I have a question. Um, question. So, okay, so this makes it sound like God allotted humans to know good and evil, like he purposed that we would know good and evil. And, you know, the story of Genesis, you know, makes it sound like that was a big mistake, like we should never have known good and evil. But I've always been confused by Genesis, um, you know, um, like God, you know, it seems like it was a really bad thing that we knew good and evil because, you know, God said when we eat, you know, once we eat, then we'll be like them and know good and evil. And so, you know, if God knows good and evil and we're made in our image and, um, you know, what's so bad about knowing good and evil? I could never understand why that was such a horrible thing. And um, unless maybe I'm not understanding the word no and that we would experience good and evil. But, I mean, yeah, I would imagine even the heavenly family, I mean, they've experienced good and evil with, you know, everything going down with Lucifer and stuff. And so um, what's so bad about knowing good and evil? And is, is Genesis actually saying something different than the community rule is in that regard? That is a very excellent question. Yeah, so I've wondered the same thing as to whether the community rule is in a sense, contradicting Genesis in regard to that. And uh, I'm not sure one way or the other. Heavenly Family guide us to know the truth of that. I mean, obviously, because of accepting Genesis, 
because of the tradition of the Mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch, we've always explained Genesis in such a way that um, that does not make it appear that God just wanted to keep us in ignorance. Because that's one way of interpreting Genesis, is that God wanted to just keep us in ignorance. Um, but that's not the only way. You know, Another way is what you just mentioned, the idea of experience in regard to good and evil. And if that's the case, you can see why God would not want us to experience evil, at least, and maybe it's this combined experience of good and evil. You know, before they had just good. And in fact, of course, if you read Genesis, everything is said to be good. It's all good. So when you have this whole thing of the good and the evil or the good and the bad, it may be simply that it's just the addition of evil that God did not want them to experience and Elohim, the gods, unfortunately did experience evil prior to that and wanted to save humanity from undergoing that experience. Now, if that's the case, here in the community rule, if it's to be interpreted in the same way, it would seem kind of odd that God allotted to the children of men that they may know or experience good and evil and the destiny, etc., etc., of all the living maybe according to the Spirit and so on. So, if, you know, if that would be the case, then that would be really a strange thing for the community rule to be saying, God wants us to experience evil along with good. So there are a few different aspects here. One thing to keep in mind is that the words and evil here are actually in square brackets, which means that they, not, they are not actually in the text. And it may have actually said something different. <laughs> Maybe it's not good and evil. So if it's not and evil, then that whole issue and the connection with what it says in Genesis isn't even there. So that's one aspect to keep in mind, um, that we don't know for sure that it says, and evil. You know, this is such a well-preserved copy that I'm not as tuned into that aspect of things because it's, there's just so much of it there. But with many of the other Dead Sea Scroll documents, there's enough missing of the text. It happens frequently enough that you're aware of it more consciously. Yeah. So I saw the square brackets. I didn't really even think much of it. Yeah, it's easier to miss, certainly, in a well-preserved text like 1QS. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of interesting how often... So these, these things where there's a blank in the text, and I shouldn't use the word blank, actually, because it's not like the scribe was writing and then left a purposeful blank. It's a missing part of the text, whether a worm ate it or whatever. It's a hole in the manuscript so that there's a word which was originally there or a sentence or however much of it that was originally there that is no longer there. Scholars refer to these things as lacunas. So this is a lacuna in the text a missing part due to damage. And <laughs> unfortunately, there's often a lacuna in the text just at the part that you really want to know. <laughs> so like a really good example, there's uh, one text that um, I think it's part of the Gospel of Peter, if I'm remembering correctly, although I could be wrong on that. And the manuscript that we have talks about Jesus and Mary Magdalene and how she was so close to him and so on and how he loved Mary Magdalene and it says that he would often kiss her on the and then there's a lacuna <laughs> <laughs> so kiss her on the on the what <laughs> and that's the part that's missing and so it's like that really changes things is it on the lips 
on the forehead, on the hand, or what? Because it totally changes the picture. Or on the way to the temple. <laughs> I'm just yeah. saying that it might not even be on a part of her body. Sure, exactly. And so, or that, you know, obviously if he's kissing her, it would be. But the point is that we don't it know what it is. It might not be saying yeah. on a particular part. So that's something that, you know, we kind of have to live with when there's a text that says something that is partial, that we don't have all of it, and the scholars are left to guess. And sometimes the guesses may be pretty good guesses. Sometimes it may be totally random as to what it might say in this particular spot. And one person's guess may be just as good as another's. Um, And so, yeah, unfortunately here, there is a lacuna in the text, and if I remember correctly, this part of the community rule is not preserved in any other manuscripts. If that's the case, then this lacuna could not be um, supplied with information from other manuscripts, because sometimes someone will translate Well, okay, I'll put it like this. Okay, so we have several copies of the community rule in the Dead Sea Scrolls. If someone makes a copy of, or sorry, if someone was to make a translation of a particular copy of the community rule, then it would be a translation of that copy. Like, here's a translation of 1QS. And they're just going to translate that not translating all the manuscripts of the community rule, just that manuscript. Another way to approach it is to say, I'm going to make a translation of the community rule, and I'm going to use all of the available texts to inform a a reconstruction of the community rule. And so that will give you different things, and you could include readings from multiple manuscripts, and you might even, let's say, for the first four columns of the community rule, or I'll just say for the first section of the community rule, you might favor the first four columns of 1QS, but let's say you get to column five, and you might instead favor some of the K4 manuscripts of the community rule and place the readings found in 1QS as secondary readings. You might only include them in footnotes or, or something like that. So there's different ways to go about it, so what we're reading here is actually, it's a translation of, yes, the community rule, but it's really primarily a translation of 1QS. And so, for instance, the, the column 5 readings are the 1QS column 5 readings. And then after 1QS, in the translation by Geza Vermesh, there is a translation of the cave four documents of the community rule. So it's not a critical addition. It's not a critical translation. It's an individual translation of the various manuscripts. Both ways have their advantages and disadvantages, but it's important to know what it is. So that said, again, if, if memory serves, no other copy of the community rule preserves this portion of it. And so it's not like the words and evil are just missing in 1QS, but are present in another copy, and Geza Vermesh is just supplying what is absent in this manuscript with what is present in another. I do not believe that to be the case. I, I think that what's happening here is this is the only part of the uh, corpus of Dead Sea Scrolls which preserves this part of the community rule. And though the words and evil are supplied by Geza Vermesh as, you know, a guess, perhaps an educated guess, into what it originally said. And... One thing about this translation is that it is not as exact as some others are in marking its 
lacuna. And so it has the words and evil in square brackets. But is there really another, like, is there one letter from those Hebrew words? And really in Hebrew, it's just one word uh, for the phrase and evil. So is it that there's one letter present that really helps to establish that as being the word? Or are there other possibilities? Or are there no letters at all? Are there two letters? You know, those are all things that would kind of either show the likelihood of this actually being and evil or of it, you know, being a, a total guess. For instance, some translations would have this written out that they may know good A N left square bracket D evil comma and end square bracket, so the right square bracket. In other words, if there was a couple letters or a letter or whatever, um, of course the word and is just one Hebrew letter. Yeah. But Anyway, just making the point that if there was more than one Hebrew letter that made the word and, and we had one of them, then they would supply whatever portion that was and then insert the square bracket in the middle of the word and just show that they're guessing at the last half of that word. Yeah, he's not that precise. Yeah, he's usually not that precise. And in, in this case, it may just be that there are no letters. Or, you know, it, it really, ultimately, there are even partial letters. And we're, oh, this looks like it's probably an olive, but oh, the angle of it, maybe it's not. Maybe it's a sheen or, or some other Hebrew letter. So, Sometimes it's hard to tell for sure, and it really comes down to specifically the exact shape and placement of the lacuna in the text. So, you know, I don't have it right in front of me, but actually, Teresa, could you go and grab the big community rule book? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Because I, I actually have a facsimile copy of 1QS, so I can actually totally look right now and find out, um, you know, if this is a total guess or not. And that might make a difference. But there are definitely more aspects to this. But as I'm looking, uh, you guys feel free if you have other comments or questions in regard to this. It, um, well, I just have two comments that, you know, I don't know if the translator who filled in the lacuna is being uh, influenced by Genesis, maybe, maybe not. Um, and then the other thing is that the translator obviously took an educated guess on what, what would be there, and it seems like the rest of the community rule is based on the two ways and their truth and falsehood, good and evil, um, righteousness and wickedness kind of thing, and so it kind of makes sense that both of those would be in this line too. You know, I don't, I don't know if that's necessarily true, but that's just my thoughts. Yeah, often a translator could be influenced <clears throat> by another text with which they are familiar. Sometimes incorrectly so, but also sometimes correctly so, because uh, you know a translator might say, okay, well, that you know, basically the author of any particular text might have been aware of a certain text. And you might be able to know, well, this author was influenced by this text, you know, or at least they were familiar with it, and thus they may have been repeating that same idea. So I think it's pretty unlikely that the author of this text would have been ignorant of Genesis. You know, he, the author... Well, well, we know that Genesis was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, you know, it might be referring to the same thing. So anyway, uh, I'll keep looking here. Okay, so I'll kind of just explain to you guys what I'm seeing as I'm looking at this. I'll tell you what I all have in front of me. 
so I have uh, Geza Vermesh's translation, and then I also have um, the translation, the Dead Sea Scrolls Study Edition, and it's more precise. It, it notes every line of the text and so on. And then I also have a facsimile edition of the Community Rule published by James Charlesworth. And it has a large image of the actual scroll, the actual column, right in front of me so I can see like the actual shape of the lacuna and, and all of that. And um, right beside it, it has a transcription in Hebrew of the text with the the restoration or, you know, the guess of, in regard to where the lacuna is. So, there's the word tov, which means good. And then there is um, the lacuna, which has part of a a word. Okay, there's a lacuna, and it kind of cuts into a word. And there is part of a letter that is visible on the edge of the lacuna. And it's pretty certain that it's a lamed, that you can see part of it. A lamed is a Hebrew letter that is a more unusual letter. It has one part of it that sticks up above the line from which most letters are hanging down in Hebrew. So you have like a line and then there's letters that are written kind of hanging down from that line. And then a lamed has this thing that sticks up quite a ways. And I can see on this page all these other lamids and this one little preserved part looks like a lamed. And so, you know, I'm pretty sure there is a lamed there, and they have a uh, wow lamed hay that they're supplying. The lamed is probably pretty certain. The wow, we don't really know. The hay, we don't really know because we can't see it. And then the rest of the letters you know, it looks like they have there what is supposed to be there. But one thing that I find kind of odd about this is the spacing, because there is, so, you know, since I don't know Hebrew well enough, I can't really establish the certainty of this. All I can say is that they're saying that there should be a Lamed there, and there really should be a Lamed there. That's pretty certain. Um, as far as the wow and the hey, I don't know if there are other words which are spelled with these same letters other than instead of a hey, something else, and if that would change it, and if that word is at all sensical within this context. However, the thing which strikes me most odd about this is that looking at the manuscript, there's a certain amount of space between each word. And, you know, it's not entirely consistent, but it's relatively consistent. Like, you can see, oh, you know, whatever, there's like the space of about a letter, one Hebrew letter between each word. Well, if there is a, uh, in this lacuna, if they've supplied the right letters, like the wow, lamed, hey, at the end of the lacuna, there's still a lot of space between where the lacuna starts and where the beginning of that word would be. So in other words, if the word really is and evil, it, there's a lot of space between good and then the words and evil. Like you could fit a whole other word in there. And so I don't know exactly what that would be. Um, so it's, it's, it's hard to say, but I, I do think it's odd. So either there's supposed to be a different word in there other than and evil, 
and it's actually a longer word because they're only supplying three letters in order to say that this is and evil. But there's a lot more space than for just three letters. And you'd have to say that the scribe was being really inconsistent, like looking throughout this whole column between words. He's like giving about a letter's space between each word. And here, if you have those three letters which they place, there's probably a uh, space for another four or five characters there between good and, and evil. So perhaps it does say good something and evil, or perhaps it says good and then another word which is a longer word and it doesn't say and evil at all. So I, I'm not sure one way or the other, but that's the situation. It seems like there's something there. If it was a smaller lacuna and, and there was the Lamed showing like there is and there wasn't so much space between the words, then I think we could probably say, oh, yeah, maybe it, it most likely just simply says and evil. But at this point, it looks like it can't simply just say and evil. It's either and something else or, you know, good and then something else entirely, or it's good, something else, and then, and evil. So that's kind of the most I can provide in terms of this at the present time. Interesting. Yeah. So anyway, um, let's, even, even though we don't know for sure whether it says and evil, I just wanted to make that as a note to say it might not even say that, and then that totally changes the discussion. But if it does say, and evil, what is it trying to say? Is it trying to say that God wanted us to experience evil? Well, it doesn't seem likely that that this text is trying to tell us that God wants us to experience evil. And we know that for several reasons. Um, primarily, it's description of how God views evil. You know, it talks about these two spirits at the end of column three going into column four. It tells us that one he loves and the other he hates. And it tells us how God wants to uh, bring an end to evil and God is opposed to evil and, and all of these different things. So in light of God's own view of evil as presented in the text, it does not make sense that it would say, oh yeah, and God wants us to experience both. So that's an interesting point because there's another section, well, the first sentence of the paragraph in Geza Vermesh's translation here. He actually translated it uh, very uh, obviously wrongly, totally changes a word from what it reads to be something completely different. And here's a sentence. Until now, the spirits of truth and injustice, or spirit, well, yes, I'll read it exactly how he has it. Until now, the spirits of truth and injustice struggle in the hearts of men, and they walk in both wisdom and folly. Well, the text doesn't say in both wisdom and folly at all. It says in wisdom or folly. Mm -hmm. So we already see that he has a bias of what this text is saying. And it's contrary to the reality of what the text actually says, how it actually reads. So that's very interesting when we consider, well, this lacuna, what does it actually say? Is it likely to say, and evil and? Because that's what he has in brackets. And if there's not room for that, or if there's, if there's more room... That it couldn't be just that. It couldn't be just that. 
Well, it's very interesting that he has that bias for men walking in both wisdom and folly. It's not a far stretch that he would think then, oh, well, God wants the children of men to know good and evil because they walk in wisdom and folly. And, uh, yeah, it's looking more and more to me like that may have just been his bias to put those words there in the brackets as a supplied um, portion of the text. Yeah, very interesting. Um, the other translation that we have up here, the Dead Sea Scrolls Study Edition, it says something similar, although different. Mm-hmm. It says, uh, and has given them as a legacy to the sons of man so that they know good, square bracket, and evil, dot, 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 and end square bracket, to cast the lots of every living being according to his spirit in, and then it has another, uh, you know, lacuna that it's filling in. But here it's interesting because it still has and evil and, just like Giza or Giza Vermesh's translation, but it has a dot, dot, dot. Right. Within their uh, supposed restoration of the lacuna. In other words, they're saying and evil, dot, dot, dot. In, in other words, there's more here. And, but it's kind of interesting because for them to say and evil, that part in the lacuna is actually at the end of the lacuna. So it, I would think it should say <laughs> to know good dot, 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 and evil, and, and then end the lacuna. <clears throat> but um, another translation, this is Charlesworth's translation in the facsimile edition. It says, he allots them to the sons of man for knowledge of good, square bracket, dot, 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 and thus, now here's the thing, I think that in this publication he actually just forgot to put the end square bracket. Mm-hmm. It looks like it. <laughs> and I want to know... Where would it have been? Yeah, exactly. Um, let's see if we can determine that. It may be right after the and, or after the... Oh, no, no, he actually does have it. It's in the middle of the word. Oh, I see it. Okay. Nice. Yes. It was just hard to notice because he's so, been very precise. Very precise. It says, for knowledge of good, square bracket, dot, 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 and thus, and then the word deciding, but it's D-E and square bracket. So the deciding the part is evidently those letters are all there and he has supplied the D-E to make the word deciding. So, in other words, it's like this. So, at the end of the lacuna, there is a partial word. We have some of the letters uh, of that word. And some translators are saying, oh, well, that word is evil but that doesn't really uh, fit in that lacuna. So you have to have something more in that lacuna. So one of the options that we're saying is that, well, it could be just that it's another word and it doesn't say evil at all. And that's how Charlesworth here is taking it. He is saying, and he's actually like comparing what he says, what his translation is with the actual manuscript makes a lot more sense because he is giving, he's dealing with the lacuna more straightforwardly, to be honest. He's saying knowledge of good, and then he's noting the lacuna, and he has at the beginning of the lacuna, dot, 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 as in we don't know what's here, because looking at it, you actually don't know. Like, it's really right after the word tov, right after the word good, is where the lacuna starts, 
And then at the end of it, the word that has part of the letters preserved might actually be the word and thus deciding or and deciding. And uh, so I find that really interesting that that might actually be what it is. So, um, you know, at this point, looking at the text itself and looking at a few of these translations, I'll definitely say that Charles Worth's translation of this makes the most sense. And um, so we don't know if it says good and evil. It might say good and then something that we don't know and, then, and thus deciding. I find this interesting. It just goes to show that it's really easy to be lazy. In, now, I'm not saying any of these translators or authors of, or yeah, the, the translators of the community rule are being lazy. That's not in my thought at all. What I'm saying is it, it shows that it's really easy to be lazy in investigating something. And it's also easy to just um, miss something, think you're doing good and not realize, you know, not on purpose being lazy, but... Just not being vigilant enough. Yeah, because, look, we have this book, the complete Dead Sea Scrolls in English. It's complete, right? The title and is actually, so. it's quite incomplete compared to other translations. Yeah, really. Yeah. And, you know, we didn't know that until we got it and read it and compared it to others. But how easy would it be for someone to purchase this book, read it, and think that they were really digging into the document? And maybe that's what their intention is, and, you know, hey. But now we have two translations here on the computer and they're very similar. There's a couple, you know, slight differences here. Um, but if we hadn't had this third translation... That actually shows the manuscript. Exactly. That makes, that's what actually is making all the difference because oh, yes. that's the thing by which we must compare everything else because that's the material reality of it. Right. And all these others are basing themselves or trying to base themselves upon it. But yeah, if this shows how important it is to be vigilant and thorough and to stop and consider have I missed anything? Is there something that I haven't actually thought to check? And just realizing, okay, well, there's more than one translation of these. It's kind of like, you know, the translations of the quote-unquote Bible. Um, there could be different reasons to have better translations. Um, there's more than one document of the community rule. And maybe there would be extra information found by new manuscripts, et cetera, et cetera. But the bottom line is, the point that's really jumping out at me is, wow, that is a really important piece of information that could have easily been never discovered if we, we didn't have this book of the facsimile of the Dead Sea Scroll, of, the, of 1QS, mm. sorry, um, with this translation by Charles Worth. Absolutely. This highlights another aspect of things. Um, <laughs> this is interesting. So Protestants were really the first ones who were really emphasizing the need to study Scripture in its original language. And, you know, there were some people doing it before the Protestant Reformation, like a couple people who were like, oh yeah, this is important to do. But a lot of people did not like this idea. So like, for example, <laughs> um, Eusebius. No, 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 sorry. don't know why I said Eusebius. 
Um, oh, come on, what's his name? It was right there on the tip of my mind. Anyway, he's he, who I'm trying to refer to is the guy who put together the first critical edition of the New Testament based off of the Greek text or the Greek texts which he had available to him and he used some Latin manuscripts and um, you know this is far later this is in like the 15th or 16th century I think it was the 16th century of the common era this isn't one of the picture quotes we've just recently done no okay so no. I, I probably wouldn't know the guy's name no, I can't believe I'm actually forgetting his name right now. But anyway. Well, Heavenly Family, please bring it back to mind. <laughs> yeah. Um, but actually, I have a question for you. I have a favor to mm -hmm. ask. Um, oh, Erasmus. Okay. There we go. Thanks. <laughs> I, 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 I got it. His name is Erasmus. And he put together, he's the guy who made the Textus Receptus, which is the, the Greek text upon which the King James is essentially based for the New Testament. And it has, you know, less than a dozen Greek manuscripts upon which the New Testament is based. And it's a critical edition. He's comparing them and trying to find the best reading. And um, he was really advocating for people to read scriptures in their original language. And he was, you know, a scholar. And other people in his day accused him of heresy because of his insistence on the importance of reading texts in their original language because they said you don't need to read it in its original language in order to understand it, and therefore to do so is a form of vanity. And so for you to promote for people to do this, for people to study scripture in their original languages, is heresy. And um, I, I actually recently read an article by a scholar named Ronald Hendel published in BAR, which is the Biblical Archaeology Review, in which he was talking about this, the kind of like threat to scholarship throughout history and particularly now. And, you know, people don't like scholarship. And so, you know, this guy, Ronald Hendel, uh, and many others, you know, there's like a list of like 500 scholars recently, recently uh, since the recent election in the U.S., a uh, conservative group put together this list of, of people who are, you know, teaching, you know, heresy or, or false things or whatever and um, liberal theology or whatever. And, you know, this is like totally not even in a religious setting. This is the academic study of the Bible that these scholars are involved in. People like Ronald Handel, James Charles Worth, you know, whatever. These are academics, not theologians. And, um, yeah, the, the, some of these people are, are being put on lists as you know, people who are promoting left-wing agendas and, and all of these things for doing nothing else than teaching scholarship in their universities. And the fact is that scholarship has had a bad rep, primarily from religious people, primarily from, you know, when it comes to... Um, you know, New Testament scholarship, primarily from Christians, and even for Old Testament scholarship, there's opposition to it from Christians and from religious Jews and so on. And that's, it's really sad when Protestants oppose scholarship and reading scripture in its original language. And, you know, I mean, this happens even in Adventism and maybe even more so in Davidia. People oppose scholarship and reading texts in their original languages, which was really a Protestant emphasis. But our, our uh, calling card is about to cut out, so we're going to hang up and then we'll call right back. Okay, thank you guys for your patience as always. So, um, you know, I was just explaining how unfortunate it is that there is such opposition to scholarship 
and original language studies and manuscript studies and all of that sort of thing, even within Protestantism, when Protestants were the ones who were really instrumental in emphasizing this. And this is how it really worked. You know, for a long time in Christianity and in Judaism, the emphasis was not so much upon the writings themselves and what they had to say. It was upon the writings as interpreted by tradition upon tradition upon tradition upon tradition. And the tradition was viewed as being equally valid, sometimes even superseding the text itself. So in Judaism, you have uh, sages like Rashi commenting on Exodus chapter 24 and saying, yes, it says that they saw Elohi, Israel, but he who says that they saw Elohi, Israel, is a liar, for no one can see God, and God is invisible, and, and all of these things. So that's literally a sage, a, a rabbi, flatly disagreeing with the text which he considers to be the literally letter for letter inspired word of God, or at least word for word, you know, given, given to uh, Moses on Mount Sinai. And yet he's saying, if someone interprets this as saying simply what it actually says, that person's lying because God is non-physical and can't be seen. And this says that, that God was seen. Well, that's a tradition that is totally taking precedence over what the text says. And so Protestants, they look at this manner of approaching Scripture, and they said, no, this isn't right. It's not about interpreting in light of tradition. We need to understand what the Scripture itself says. And in order to do that, we need to get back to the Scripture itself. So let's study it in its original language. Let's not take a, an, a translation, which is really an interpretation. Every translation is an interpretation, and Protestants recognize that. And that's why they said, no, let's get back to the original language, and let's try to understand this text in light of its own day, its own setting, and, and all of that. And the language is just one element of that. But let's read the other text. And that's why, you know, the original Protestant reformers were not opposed to the Apocrypha or what were considered to be apocryphal writings. They read them. They believed that they were important, but they didn't consider them to be inspired scripture. And that's true even for what they considered to be New Testament Apocrypha, books like Hebrews, Jude, James, and Revelation. For a couple hundred years, there were many Protestant Bibles which had those books separated as a separate section in the back. And even some Bibles even labeled them Apocrypha. So you had the Old Testament, and then you had a section called Apocrypha, and you had books like Wisdom of Solomon, and Wisdom of Ben Sirach, and Maccabees, and all of that. And then you had the New Testament, which had 23 books in it. And then you had a new section, Apocrypha, and it had Hebrews, James, Jude, and Revelation. So that's how lots of Protestants had their Bibles for a couple hundred years. And some of them, it, it didn't necessarily, in some copies, it didn't say uh, after New Testament Apocrypha and then had those books. In some of them, it would just uh, not number them anymore. So you'd have number one, Matthew, number two, Mark, number three, Luke, and so on. And then you'd go all the way to the end of Paul's letters, and then you'd have the last four with no numbers, and it would just be Hebrews, James, Jude, and Revelation. And they would often have Martin Luther's introductions to those books, which were actually his explanation of why he doesn't consider them scripture. And it, for James, he actually says it's contrary to all scripture. For Revelation, he says, I cannot detect one hint that this comes about through 
the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And the, the genuine apostles had nothing to do with this type of secrecy and symbolic imagery and, and all of that. So, you know, he, he was definitely engaged in the scholarship of his day. <laughs> he was not just buying into the idea of a canon. He was not just reading a translation and just saying, oh yeah, this is really where it's at. No, the Protestant reformers were the beginners of modern biblical scholarship. And then what we know as Adventists, as apostate Protestantism, left all of that. But scholarship continued. And so modern biblical scholarship is actually the continuation of a Protestant endeavor. And even non-Protestant biblical scholars recognize that. So as Protestants started studying the scripture in such a meticulous uh, and critical way, not critical as in negative toward it, but critical as in asking serious questions and trying to understand it in its own right, uh, using the original languages and context of the day, you know, the day of the original writing of those various scriptures, and so on, you know, using critical thinking skills in approaching the text. As Protestants began to employ these methods, some Catholics were like, hey, that's actually a pretty good idea. We should try and understand these texts for what they say, even if the Catholics in their own practice would incorporate traditions that were definitely post-biblical. Some said, well, you know, hey, it's a good idea to study it like that. So let's study it like that. And, and Jews, some Jews would say, hey, yeah, let's study it like that. And people who weren't even religious, you know, people from all different... Um, philosophies and religions and non-religions and whatever. And that was really the birth of modern biblical scholarship. And so we ought to be grateful for modern biblical scholarship because these are the guys, and you know, obviously we've talked about this in previous calls, but these are the guys who are actually caring to even find these texts and translate them and find manuscripts of Paul's letters and and preserve them and translate them and study them critically as compared to one another and try to understand the development of the various textual traditions that have come down to us. So this is a very important endeavor. And, you know, I'm certainly grateful for, you know, this facsimile edition of the community rule, for example, because without it we wouldn't have been able to really examine this particular issue as we just did. And it encourages me all the more to learn Hebrew more and more because I need to be able to look at the Dead Sea Scrolls as we have them, the actual fragments, and just read them and see what it says without depending on translators. And I encourage you guys, too, to learn Hebrew and to to learn the original texts that are behind all these manuscripts. Of course, it's not that everyone has to in order to understand the text. We don't all have to do that. You know, it's not like um, it's impossible to understand the message or anything without learning these texts because absolutely that's not the case. We can all understand the message without learning other languages. But it is certainly a useful tool and one of the reasons why we can understand these texts without all of us learning these languages is because at least some do. I mean, if no one did, we would be at a loss when it came to the community rule. <laughs> you know, I mean, what would we do? We wouldn't have translations of it into our language necessarily. Or if, well, yeah, basically we wouldn't if people weren't learning other languages. So it is an important thing for sure. And uh, I think it's important for us if any one of us still has vestiges of antagonism to scholarship, we need to be rid of those vestiges. We need to get rid of that antagonism. And yeah, sure, scholars aren't perfect. Scholars have 
good ideas and bad ideas, just like everyone else. Some scholars do a better job at some things and not so good with others, and that's just the way it is. It's not like we should put our trust in, in scholarship itself or, or anything like that, or in the opinions of particular scholars, or consider an opinion to be valid just because it came from someone with a degree. No, not at all. But let's get rid of the whole anti-scholarship thing, which is really just a subcategory within a general anti-education mentality that unfortunately is present among conservative Christians too often. So true. I used to be so critical of education. I would mock educated people. I like, and I just recognized how ignorant I sounded and was, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, how awful. And that is largely why we are so far behind in some of these things that we should know, that we could know outside of inspiration, but we just don't know. We're just catching up. Exactly. No, I mean, seriously, scholarship on the whole mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch thing, man, they've been on that for a few hundred years now. But unfortunately, there's this whole anti-education, anti-scholarship thing that came about in apostate Protestantism and carried on. It's, it, you know, formed as a part of our culture, even. It's not even just, it's not even that just Christians have this idea, but it's a part of our culture, so unfortunately, to look down upon education, upon going to university, and, and it's, it's viewed as... Yeah, that it, it, people people think that there's something negative about education and that it's trying to... Uh, really, a lot of it is people think that education is trying to take people away from the Word of God mm -hmm. and stuff like that, where people think, oh, well, if you go and learn that, then, you know, you can't just trust the good old KJV or, or whatever, <laughs> you know, if you get into other language studies or... Just learning in general, people end up, you know, anything that you learn in a university, a lot of people don't like because it can be a threat to their belief system. How awful is that? <laughs> you know, just because something is a threat to our belief system mm -hmm. or to one's belief system, people oppose that learning. It's like, oh, man, there's so much we could learn. So... Let's not be opposed to education. Oh, let's not. <laughs> anyway, any comments or questions in regard to all of what we have been here discussing? I just uh, agree with what Teresa said as far as um, um, just basically coming against scholars in the past because they were coming against my religion that was, you know, I was definitely base, basing it on tradition and, uh, you know, idolatry of what I, I wanted and hoped it to be. And, um, you know, I just done that until quite recently. I had um, a Catholic friend of mine uh, gave me this book called Crossing the Tiber. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's by Stephen Kay. And um, you were talking about tradition and Catholics and what they think and everything. And, um, he, he was, he's promoting, actually he is promoting tradition, but he's, he's saying in this, he says, what basis do Protestants have for trusting the 27 writings that make up the New Testament? Um, the answer comes back, we must trust them because they're inspired. Yes, but how do we know they're inspired? There are many hundreds of writings and epistles passing from hand to hand, city to city, province to province, and he's just going on and on just to say, you know, you know why? You basically saying that the Protestants are holding to this scripture canon because that's the that's the one that the Catholics held to. You know, but he's it's just a really interesting Catholic book. You know, kind of like you're saying that they it's a really good book. You know, I mean they're they're really talking about 
scholarship and history and, and not just believing things because uh, a canon said it's inspired. And anyway, um, yeah, Catholics are, um, they're, they're, they have a lot of uh, potential. They're, a lot of them are just, you know, similar to a place that, that we are and as far as a material reality in a lot of ways. I know that they're, you know, super spiritualists, but yeah, I think the Heavenly Family is bringing them intellectually to a point of, of breaking out of that, hopefully. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. Some Catholics, you know, Catholics who are obviously involved in their religion and involved in uh, Protestant Catholic debates especially, or at least are aware of the issues of difference, do have a point when, when pointing out that, hey guys, here you are all anti-tradition, and yet your very canon is accepted purely on tradition, not on something that it says in the books which you accept themselves, because nowhere in those books does it say these are the books. And so, yeah, uh, Catholics are certainly correct in pointing out that that is merely a tradition, and saying, oh, we don't accept traditions from the perspective of a Protestant just isn't true. The other aspect to that also is Protestants often draw way too sharp of a distinction between tradition and the Bible. As if the Bible is one thing and tradition is a totally different thing. Well, in fact, the Bible is actually full of a whole bunch of traditions. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that these are all man-made mythical traditions or something like that. Some traditions are true, some are false. Just like Outside of the Bible, there are some traditions that actually go back a long way and represent some true element of something. So, it's, you know, each tradition should be examined in its own right. Is this based on truth or is it not based on truth, whether it's in the Bible or outside the Bible? But it's simply not true to think that there's no tradition in the Bible. There's, it's all traditions. It's all you know, like you could use the phrase the biblical tradition. Now, obviously that has its flaws in that there is no the Bible, so you cannot have the biblical tradition. And also within the books of any given canon, there are actually different traditions of thought and different traditions of history. So, for example, in the Pentateuch, uh, during the Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread this year, we studied the various quote-unquote, Pentateuchal traditions. That's one way we could put it. We studied the Exodus story as presented in various texts or various traditions. You know, we have J, E, and P for the Exodus story. And you could call each of those a separate tradition concerning the Exodus. And, hey, those are three different biblical traditions. And, uh, you know, so it, it's not that the Bible is one thing and tradition is another. So that's kind of another inaccuracy in the Protestant view of things, for sure. So anyway, I know that we should wrap this up pretty soon. Um, I just wanted to ask, though, if anyone did have any last pressing comment or question I got one. You know, in regard to what we've been discussing tonight. Go ahead. Did God experience evil before Lucifer came in and started? The people didn't even know that, or the angels didn't even know that Jesus was the Son of God. So, so apparently, they didn't know evil until Lucifer came in. So apparently, God didn't want them to know. Well, it may be that evil just was not there to be known, you know. And, and I don't know of any evidence which would suggest that. God experienced evil before Lucifer. In fact, so far as we know, especially as 
actually, uh, as angels revealed to Ellen White in vision, the mystery of iniquity had its commencement in the heart or in the way of thinking of Lucifer. And, um, you know, that's, that's so far as we know. And so uh, I don't know of anything which would indicate the existence of evil prior to that time and without it existing, of course, our heavenly family and all of the various beings of the universe could not have um, experienced it. Amen. All right, so... um, we can continue on this whole investigation tomorrow night. There's more to this text that we have to investigate, I think, in this line here at the end of column four of 1QS. Um, but I've really been enjoying this discussion. Mm-hmm. So would anyone like to thank our Heavenly Family? I will. Heavenly Family, uh, I thank you for uh, tonight's call and for um, basically teaching us, uh, you know, more specifically how to investigate and how to be diligent investigators and to um, you know, to just be more diligent about the things that um, we just, you know, so often just take things for granted and thank you for just pointing out that we shouldn't really do that. And I pray your hand a blessing upon each one of us. Give us a wonderful Sabbath day. Bless us. Um, as we minister to to others today, your truth. In the name of the branch, he and she. Amen. 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 All right. Love you all. Shabbat shalom.